guys, it's me. I'm back. What's up, party people? We're like, Mads, come on. All right, this is this this show is taking a turn for the. Oh. <laughs> All right, friends, Monster Bass family, we're here, we're live today. We're doing things a little bit different today. We're talking about the classic, but first, it's all about being on the road. As you see, I'm not my normal backdrop. I'm not in the studio. I'm in the family car. We're out on a trip, and we also have Rick and Rafi. They're MIA. They're on a plane somewhere. We're trying to connect with them. So also on the road. They're on the road to the classic. So it's all about Bassmaster Classic. We're going to get into that. We have some amazing footage. We have two other guests some hosts that are going to call in we'll see what happens but they're on the road so it's all about on the road what it takes to get to the classic and speaking of the classic we're going to go backwards in time just a little bit and i think the show we're going to have an open option to call in we want to talk all about what bass fishing tournaments mean for the monster bass community we want to know i, I personally want to know are you influenced by tournaments does it matter what the top tournament anglers are using do you buy your gear in direct connection to what they're using, how they're fishing, do you follow their fishing techniques? Do bass fishing tournaments inspire you? What's your, your best memory? Is it important? How important are the professionals in the influence of your life? So I think that's part of the show today. And also we can, we're gonna talk, of course, about the technology and how things have changed, but to set the stage to go backwards, bass, B-A-S-S. -S. And so I had to do some homework, I got some notes. Bass anglers sportsman society most people don't even know that's bass 1967 ray scott founded that and it was in 1971 and fix did some work so fix is here he's my wingman today fix did some amazing work to pull some original footage of the first bass master class they actually called it the bass masters classic so fix if you're with me let's roll the tape this is going to be a two minute video he i think he compiled about an hour and a half but he brought it down to it's two minutes gives us a view of what bass fishing tournaments were back in 1971. play that fix if you can ladies and gentlemen our society is uh, the bass angler sportsman society is four years old in january we started putting on national bass fishing tournaments with the idea of bringing bass fishing to a rightful place among all sports our father we ask see the watch over each man bring him through a good fishing day and back to the harbor safely. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. It all started several years ago when a man named Ray Scott got a bunch of his fishing buddies together in Montgomery, Alabama and founded the Bass Angler Sportsman Society. Now his members in every state in the nation and they don't just fish. They want to improve, preserve, and protect bass fishing for future generations. The main reason most of these real good fishermen are here is pride. They all think they are the best. And on any given day, on any given body of water, almost any of them stand a good chance of winning. Well, Ray Scott got to thinking about it, about how you could settle on who was the best in any given year. And he came up with what he calls the Bass Masters Classic. What if he takes the top 24 men in his tournament point standings, puts them on a jetliner, and flies them to a lake none has ever fished before, doesn't tell anybody where they're going until the plane is in the air. That way, if they all had identical equipment, no prior knowledge of the lake, and on top of that, it was a tough lake to fish, it'd make for a pretty fair test, wouldn't it? Bobby Metter of Baton Rouge, Louisiana is our first day leader with a nice string that weighed 15 pounds, 12 ounces. Well, there aren't any luckers on his stringer, but Tom Mann is weighing in his second consecutive limit of 10 bass, which should put him out in front. That's Bobby Murray of Hot Springs, Arkansas. And although that isn't a limit, there's a few real good bass on there. 
All right. So emotion should be raw. Fix, you saw that the other day for the wow. first time. And it just was one of those things when that hits you. And, and hopefully some people got to see this for the very first time in their lives. And it, it should spark some ideas. One thing is top 24 were actually put on a jet and they didn't tell them where they're going to fish. So certain amount of rods, certain amount of reels, certain amount of gear, they could only bring so much with them. And they were flown to a location they should have no prior knowledge. That's really awesome to think about that. And they took the 24 guys, they got up in the air and they're like, hey, we're going to go fish Lake Mead, which at the time was not really well known to most of these anglers. They're over on the East Coast, a lot of them. And they're like, let's go and fish a lake that we don't know how we're going to catch them, who's been catching them, what's going on. And they just went out. The other thing is 10 fish, 10 fish that didn't look like they're probably going to swim away at the end of the day. So that's all of these things. Fix. I, I, I know we got some other people maybe calling in. We're going to have some other. I want to know from your perspective, the first time you saw that. What what hit you the most? Because that you told me one thing, and I think it's really cool. Because from your view, it's not really that old of a video. What 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 hit you the most? That what stuck out the most when you first saw that? I mean, okay, so I I went to Michigan with Rafi and Rick, and got to be on one of the gentlemen's boats, and just like having all the technology out there and everything. I'm just like, well, wow, this is amazing. I like. What did they do when this sport first started? <laughs> like, I'm that, pretty sure people were able to catch fish without all this stuff. But, like, now I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, materialistic much. Um, I don't want to talk down on the, it, obviously. Yeah, no, but, no, like, that, but that's the hot topic now is, like, what's yeah. become, what are the requirements, Thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 minimum to get in the game just for the electronics, not to mention the $100,000 boat, all the, yeah. all the technology, all the gear, probably another $100,000 in gear and lures and baits and then, you may end up with forward facing sonar and you're just using a little $2 minnow out in front doing some, some strolling, but that's a whole other yeah. piece. I, I, I think with tournaments, it's interesting because you've seen the evolution happen from the monster bass side and we're making these baits and we're worried about anglers. I, I think for me, the biggest, dis, like the discussion is, is, is that what is influencing us as anglers is the top of the food chain, the professional, bass fishing tournament we had bass fishing tournaments kind of split a few years ago so we had bass and then we had major mm. league fishing and so we just had red crest we have a championship and this week it's all about so and it's it's funny the commercialization of all of it is bass pro shops bass master classic presented by jockey outdoors <laughs> that is a lot it just it right is. there just thinking of the title it used to be i love how he said the reason most anglers are here for pride they yeah. wanted to be the best in fishing. They want to be able to tell their friends like I caught the best fish and yeah, I caught 10 of them a day and I probably cooked them up and ate them and we could discuss recipes later. But now it's this commercialized monster that's huge. And there's still, I've got some fishers, some anglers, some fishermen that, that I admire the anglers that are there. Like I, I can't wait to see how Brandon Pollock does. And we, it's like, a couple people that I'm like, I'm invested in them as humans, mm -hmm. invested in them in their fishing careers. I want to see how they tackle the lake. But at the same time, I want to see what happens. I mean, it's like we got Ben Milliken. That's like this outspoken angler that was an influencer. And then he's proven himself time and time again. Like he is throwing his name out there. He's a winner and he had his birth into this classic. And so we're going to, I think, I guess there's a guy that's 17 that's fishing. And then people that have been there 10 times as classic past winners and 10 times yeah. at the classic themselves. So this event to me is super exciting. I love to see the tournament, but I want to know from, you know, we got the lot. I think the, the call, the, the phone number is already open for people to call yeah. in. I'm excited tonight to talk about bass fishing tournaments. And is it yeah. that important? We have a great guest coming in later. He's, he's a fan favorite. I know. I don't know how much he's involved in tournaments and I think that's just going to be fun. So Josh Moody, when he gets on the show, he's known for his freedom toss. He's known for <laughs> getting out and beating the bank when necessary. He's a working man's man. He I, does this amazing yard where he does wheelies for heaven's sakes in his ride on lawnmower. So we'll talk to him a little bit about that, but I want to know from his perspective, because he goes out and he slings it and he loves to catch fish. And I want to just touch on that idea of like, is he connected to tournament angling? Is that important to him? Um, I think we have Jeremy. Is Jeremy called in yet? Because I know we, we're waiting for Jeremy to is, see. Is he in Little uh, Rock, Arkansas? 
So Jeremy was it's fishing the Lone Star, and I know he's on the road. So we're talking about being on the road, oh, and so sick. he was going to call in, and I, I'm fine. Well, we'll just take some calls, let's, whoever they are. If, we have one if call, call so we can take him in, and uh, we'll see and, who this uh, is. So yeah, I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> on the road, let's go. All right. Hey caller, are you with us? All right, man, go for so, it. So when I when I first got my cell phone, I did I'm off my mom my parents cell phone plan i did live in little rock arkansas but uh yes i kept the number what's happening guys uh appreciate you and let me call in and, and yeah. i'm pretty amped up right now i really am <laughs> that's good well i think you I mean, this is so cool because i'm on the road you're on the road rick and rafi are like 10 000, 20 000 feet above all of us were you just at the classic is this is what i, I got some feedback like maybe you were over pre-visiting setting seven up at the expo tell me what's going on where are you at so yes and no, I wasn't actually there for the classic. I was there for a work trip. I planned this work trip over a month ago, not realizing I was planning the trip to Tulsa the week of the Bassmaster Classic. So kind of good timing, kind of poor planning because now I'm driving back to Dallas. I'm probably going to go back though to Tulsa probably Friday evening, maybe Saturday, maybe Sunday because I'll tell you, uh, it is it is quite the scene there in Tulsa. Uh, I went to dinner at Buffalo Wild Wings last night. There's like fishing guys there. Uh, you know, stayed at one hotel. I'll, I'll give you kind of I'll set the scene a little bit right of the hotel I'm staying at last night. It's right next to the convention center in downtown Tulsa. And and I, again, I kind of I didn't plan it that way. It just so happened that you know I had this work trip in Tulsa and I'm staying right next to it the convention center, but I walk into the hotel and this is just the Aloft downtown, right? It's not like this is a big fancy hotel, but the Aloft, it's, it's, it's okay. It's a decent, decent hotel. I walk in and on the floor, very big, it says, welcome to the Bassmaster Classic. And there's like all the cool. right there. And I'm like, all right, like that's pretty cool that you're greeted that way at this hotel, like right when you walk in. So I get my key, I get my check in, I get, you know, I get my key to check in. I go to the elevators. There's four elevators. I'm kind of setting the visual for you. All four elevators have ad clicks that come together and open and close. And all four of them are people of, of like, you know, pro anglers on their boats, you know, hold, you know, pulling fish out of the water. And it's just That's like, cool. I mean, we all love bass fishing so much, right? I mean, this is the Super Bowl of bass fishing. I've never really been that big into tournaments. I'll admit, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, yeah. But the environment that is around, the buzz that is around a whole town that is all geared towards the sport, the hobby, the passion that we all have for bass fishing, like you walk away from there and like you just, I'll just tell you, it was really hard for me to stay focused today for my actual job and my work that I need to be done because I just wanted to go fish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, okay, so you, you just nailed it because what you just finished with, I think, is my takeaway from all this. And this is my big message to life in these things is you came away with a desire to go fish. That clinched it already yeah. at the end of the show. Yep. Turn off the mic, we're out. It's interesting to me because I, I grew up, I played some team sports. My family was involved in team sports. Then I got into individual sports. I was a golf pro. I was a snowboarder. Did all these different things it's really hard for me to get involved and super excited about team sports. And the reason is exactly what you just said. We all get together. The most watched thing on television is a Super Bowl in the United States. And when the Super Bowl ends, yeah. it's really hard to go find some pads and 20 something other people that you're going to go and you're going to hit helmets together and go play football. I know you can go toss the ball. And I used to do that yeah. with my brother and my dad and all these different things, but literally sure. to yeah. get super excited about fishing, because fishing is intense and the tournament, and this is the Super Bowl of fishing, and you can go and do exactly what those people, holy cow, I see some other people come on the screen. You can hey. participate, <laughs> you can participate in the exact <laughs> sport that they did. And I think that's this amazing piece of bass fishing. You're inspired to go fish. Now, I, th I think that's a really neat thing. Yep. You get to go and fish and do exactly what the top pros do and the gear they do. When you, I wanna know, when did you get involved? I mean, I know you're fishing journey a little bit, but when did you start to follow bass fishing tournaments? Was that a thing for you, like an evolution? Take us down that road a little bit for your mindset yeah. of like bass fishing tournaments. 
Yeah, so I, like real quick, like kind of thirty second elevator pitch here of like you know my history with bassing. I, I fished all my life. Look, a little bit of uh, crappie fishing, a little bit of you know sand bass here and there when they're running through the creek, a little bit of catfish, you know, just whatever will bite type of fishing, right? You know, if it's a bass, awesome. If it's not, that's awesome too. Uh, so I grew up doing that. It wasn't until I was thirty seven years old, right? I'm forty three now, so just five or six years ago, that I got really hooked, no pun intended, but hooked on bass fishing. It was a way to relieve stress from work, a way to relieve stress of kind of some things in life at the time. Um, and from that point forward, like, I have a very obsessive personality. If I'm going to do something, I'm going all in. And it was all in for me. Now, in that environment, I never really took the time to watch, like, what pros were doing. But shortly after that, because I'm so obsessed with and not just go out and get sunk all the time. I wanted to actually catch some fish. I right. wanted to tune in to the to what the pros are doing. And it's like, okay, if that guy is fishing, you know, some grass, shallow, using a swim jig or a buzz bait, while it's the opposite, meaning instead of being on the water throwing towards the bank, I'm on, at that time, was on the bank throwing out towards the water. I can at least begin to put some patterns together to, to increase my chances or my odds of catching fish when I go out. So, I'll tell you, like, I, I, not only watching tournaments, but watching other guys on YouTube. I think that's why I have such a passion of, like, sharing tips and techniques because that's truly how I've learned the last five or six years how to fish was through that. So I'm very grateful for the people that have kind of pioneered the way of sharing tips and techniques via content, YouTube, et cetera, whether it be a pro guy or an influencer, et cetera. Um, but, awesome. yeah, so I, that, that's, that's kind of what, what drew me to the pros and watching is, like, hey, I want to see – what they're doing, piece together a pattern, and then, you know, increase my odds of making sure that I have the same successes or close to it. Yeah, yeah and I'll tell you, we, we got to get these guys on here because we just had, this is what, it, it's all coming together right here live. On the road, I'm in the car, Jeremy's in the car, you guys just made it to the hotel. The, we got the update. I want to know, were there lures on your pillows when you walked in your hotel room welcoming you to the Classic? Rick and Rafi are here, and then we're going to get back to the conversation. But tell us about the welcome you received, because when I'm hearing Jeremy talk, the hotel is like rolling out the red carpet for the anglers. What was your reception? Is it is it all well, bass fishing where it, you guys it, are at? Well, Rick if, and if Ryan, you know Rick, what's can happening. You see Jeremy? Yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna tell you, Jeremy. We got Rick uh, and Rafi. I, we got Rick and Rafi here on the screen. I don't know if you can see your screen. Rick and Rafi, can you guys? Oh chime no, sorry, in and I'm, tell just, us? I'm just on my phone. Yeah. No, it's right. Rick and Rafi are here. I think. Can you guys chime in and tell us what your reception was like? Because Jeremy was filling us in. He had the full welcome of bass fishing. What What was your hotel like? Yeah, we uh we we had the we had the red carpet rolled out for us too. In fact, uh, we showed up and uh, uh, I had booked. It, it's funny, uh, <clears throat> you know. I was I was getting ready to leave and and, and uh, my family was like, "Where are you going?" I was like. I'm packing for the Bassmaster Classic. They're like, it's not until next week. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they said, well, you sent us a calendar invite for, for next week. And uh, I didn't think much of it until we went to check into the hotel and uh, he couldn't find our reservation because I had booked it for next week. <laughs> and uh, thankfully we had flights and uh, and status with the, uh, with the hotel. So they were able to uh, give us these beautiful accommodations here in Tulsa. And nice. uh, they actually uh, they actually apologized to us, gave us a cookie. Yeah. Wow, you guys did it. All right. <laughs> and uh, media credentials. Wow, look at you see. Bassmaster Classic media credentials. You guys are in the hunt. I know Monster Bass has a booth. Can you tell us? I, I think we're talking about the claw. We've got baits you're giving away. You've got the, you're going to have the red carpet rolled out for the Monster Bass community. Do you guys know your booth number so people can come by anybody in the area that can come say hi? Yeah, if you're in the area, we'd love to see you. We're booth 2123. Uh, we'll have some amazing show specials. We'll be giving away some free stuff. Uh, we got the, cr the the crane game, better known as the craw game. Uh, yeah. The craw machine. <laughs> the craw machine. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's a good chance that I'm going to be able to late a last minute wild card entry into the classic. Uh, I feel like I got as good a shot as anyone because I've played a lot of video games in my day. And so I feel like... I can read a screen as good as anyone. And so I feel like, you know, I'm a big fan of forward facing sonar. And so I feel like, uh, 
it should it shouldn't be too hard. This fishing thing isn't all that it's cracked up to be. It's it's not that. No, you see the, you you see the fish. You find them. You drive around when you're idling. You put four or five different sonars like look in different directions. You find them. You throw a hook out there. They jump in the boat. So, no, I mean, my it, question, it's anybody's game. <laughs> my question to Lone Star would be: How does it feel to know that like I can now? I'm better than you. <laughs> I'm not taking the bait. I'm not taking the bait. <laughs> I'm not doing it. So I'm not doing so it. So Jeremy, Jeremy you, you're, it's cool because you're talking about now there's no smoke screen in bass fishing because they truly have cameras out on the boats. You get to see exactly what they're doing, whether they're looking at forward facing sonar, they're not, they're dragging a deep plug, big worm, doesn't matter. You get to see exactly how the best anglers in the world catch the fish. I love that. And you can apply that to yourselves. We can use it. I know Rick and Rafi, they're watching this from a bait manufacturer's end. What are the hot new baits? What do we got to worry about the techniques? And then we go back and we can fine tune to the monster bass community to share things that make more sense. And we see somebody do something and they didn't quite educate the masses because these guys, I mean, for heaven's sakes, they've only got so many hours to catch the biggest and best fish to try to win. But we get to go back as a monster bass family and try to break that down and share. Let me ask you though, I think Jeremy, you have a perspective last year's Bassmaster Classic was one potentially using and we're going to get we're going to dive into this right now the aqua view tell me your your response and, and i want to know because you kind of set that up with me the aqua view is an underwater camera that is legal to use during practice but you can't use that camera as a tool that's been designated illegal during during tournament fishing tell me the, the little story quickly and tell me your view on aqua view versus forward-facing sonar because i know you have an opinion this is all about sharing opinions whether we agree or not i want to know your view of like the aqua view and how that played into the bassmaster classic last year and and it, it's fair to say look yeah this is an opinion but I, but I'll, I'll state why it's my opinion as well so i think that's fair to the conversation because it relates back to my earlier comment but first for those of you that like this isn't me making it up this is actually like the angler himself has done video like showing and saying how he won um, last year's Bassmaster Classic. So he basically, during practice, dropped the AquaView camera down to the bottom of you know the spot he was on because he wasn't sure if they were fish or rocks is what he was seeing. And he basically dropped it down and saw via like a live video feed that these were actually large spotted bass that were relating to the bottom. And so once he saw that and knew that, he's like, okay, well, then those are actually fish I could catch. Now he then came back during the tournament, used forward-facing sonar, you know, dropped his lure down there and was able to catch them. Uh, okay, like, it's not cheating. It's, it's all permissible by the rule. So that's not ever been my argument. My argument kind of relates back, and this is just my perspective, my opinion, but it relates back to my original comment of when I first started watching pro fish is because I wanted to be able to see what they're doing and gotten replicated, even if I'm a bank angler, as best as possible. Neither of those things, or facing sonar or using AquaView, is something that can be relatable to, I would argue, 80 to 90% of the anglers out there that don't have means to get on the water to use those tools. So I feel like it's just it's just not as relatable. For me, it's not how I got to spend my time on the weekends fishing. But it doesn't – look, I'm not – not knocking on it people use live shiners like if that's what you want to do go do it i just wish it was more relatable as it used to be so guys could learn how to fish like i did like like if, if i started my journey bass fishing like i did five or six years ago today i promise you i would not be able to learn how to fish from the bank and learn everything that i've learned by just watching yeah. pros now use sport fishing so much. wouldn't work no, I, I wouldn't be able to learn no, to on I, I mean, how, how to learn bass that's fishing. a net natural progression learning and there's nothing wrong from going from the bank maybe into a, a smaller boat kayak whatever and then maybe into your bass boat and kind of move that progression not to say that you have to go that route either and i think that's an important thing it's like the pinnacle of fishing for some people is fishing from the bank or like wading out in a stream or going to a small creek and so it's funny that we think like oh it's the pinnacle it's the super bowl we have to have fifty thousand dollars on our boat in electronics that's not always the case. And that's why I think today's show is kind of important to see is I want to know how important is it? Oh, you yeah. said relatable. I love that Bassmaster Classic is presented by Jockey Outdoors. We're all relatable and having undergarments. I think that's important. Like that's a cool thing that it's not 
presented by an electronic company. I think that's maybe a neat stance that they're taking. I don't know if they did that on purpose, but having something in fishing that we can all relate to, I was, I was teasing about the undergarment thing, but it really is, is you don't have to be on a boat to be a bass angler. I think that's really important, especially in the monster bass community. We have a lot of people that fish from the bank. I spend probably half the time walking across the street from my house. And you mentioned a release of stress from work to go over and just fish from the yeah. shore. How cool to connect with nature. You walk up, you see what kind of fish are along the shore. You see what's going on. Maybe often I'll see a couple of bass that are in shallow looking to feed. It, it kind of incites some things in my own mind of what kind of presentation I'm going to put out there. And so me connecting with nature has nothing to do with the boat at, at probably 50% of the time in my fishing career. So I appreciate your insight of you yeah. know, the terms. I do want to know, like, do you have a favorite angler in the field? Because I think what we have, like, I think there's 57, I think some 56 anglers this year. Do you have a favorite angler? Are you going to put a projection out there? Who's going to win? You know, I really, I really don't. I haven't really put that much thought into it. Um, maybe next year I will because it'll be essentially on my home lake of Ray Roberts. So I, I might be able to kind of pair up a, an angler's, you know, strength um, versus what the, how the lake sets up. Um so, so no, I, I actually don't have a favorite per se. Uh, I just, I, I just hope there's, I don't know. I, I, I'm gonna say it, but I just, I just hope it's not all forward facing sonar personally. I mean, look, like Chris, like last night, I hit up two random ponds in Tulsa. Like, <laughs> met a buddy. We went to two random ponds, ran across at least ten other anglers, right, that are bank angling in these two different ponds. And, you know, you think back again, like how I learned to fish and watching, right. you know, even pros, you know, at that particular time, like it's, it's, it's just a related relatability factor that I feel like it's a disconnect from what the majority of anglers are able to do, which is bank angling, or maybe yeah. even just not have the means to go afford it. Uh, I, I certainly have the means if I, if I you know, needed to or wanted to, to go buy the equipment and gear. So I, I personally hate it when people say, oh, well, you don't use forward facing sonar because you can't afford it. Like, I, for me, it's a personal choice. Like I, I absolutely choose how I want to go spend my days on the water and what techniques I want to use. Um, you know, so, so I, I, I hope people aren't you know like sharing that or saying that. But you, know, you just think about the guys you come across when you're bank angling, and it's like, what what is there really to learn about shaking a minnow when you're watching the pros do it all weekend? I just I, I was talking real, real quick. I was talking to some guys this morning. So really quick to go set the setting right, staying in the hotel. You pull up to the hotel, and there's at least five or six rat boats. I'm sorry, rat trucks, right? Um, all kinds of uh, industry guys, you know, whether they're company guys or they're actual pro guys. But, I mean, the setting around these hotels right now and around the convention center is like you walk in, and it's like, hey, there's the AFCO guys over there in that corner. There's the losing striking guys over in that corner. There's a couple of pro over there having breakfast together. Like, it's a pretty cool scenario versus normally just you know down at breakfast just all business guys yeah it's still business but it's fishing guys like I, it was a really cool experience for breakfast but i was having conversations with some of them and this topic came up and the best i've heard it said anybody say so far is josh jones who if you don't know who josh jones is uh he has voted well over 100 double digit fish he is a big user of four facing sonar all right but even he himself was like i wish the pros would go to a format of like four tournaments with it and four tournaments that you can't use it and allow everyone to then use all of their abilities and skills with it and without it. It's like that same clip that you just shared, right? Of Ray Scott, the very first, let's put people on a plane, <laughs> let's equalize the equipment. They don't know anything about it and let's put them there. I think we equalize strength that way by doing four tournaments with it, four without it. And, uh, you know, you got to be a well-rounded angler to compete to, to me josh jones on a chris Zaldane, Zaldane podcast shared that yeah. and i thought that was the most intelligent way that i've heard anyone create a position about forward facing sonar in the you know the professional series to say here's how you could have basically uh, both parties put all this nonsense to rest about whether you should use it or not use it and just say half the time you can half the time you can't let's see who can compete to me that would be an amazing solution no, it's cool. And I, I think for me, yeah, it's good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hold, hold on, guys. We got, we, we're on a little bit of a time crunch. We thought that we would yeah. jump in for 10 yeah. minutes. Now we have literally 10 seconds because we, we, we have somebody <laughs> waiting for us. Uh, okay. So 
Yeah. Just want to say hello and goodbye. But also, yeah. also, I think Dustin, uh, you know, at the Red Crest this weekend, uh, uh, Dustin said he was he didn't want feel he didn't want to win on his home lake, staring at forward facing sonar the entire time. And I think yeah. they showed a lot of him. And I don't know if it was intentional or not, but they showed a lot of him where he wasn't just staring at forward facing sonar. Um, yep. And granted, that's his home lake. But uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and we're going to say Ben Milliken for the win. And uh, <laughs> it has nothing, I don't think it has anything to do with the baits that he's going to throw. I just think he's a heck of a stick. And uh, I'm just going to go out on a limb. Thanks, you, thanks you guys. Later. You guys are awesome. All right. Back, hey, thank back you. to work. All right. go, hey, go set up the booth, would you? All right, remember, booth 2123. Uh, what, a, what a cool conversation. It's great. I love that they were able to hop in on the road this week, all about the classic, talking with Jeremy right now, fishing the Lone Star about forward-facing sonar, talking about technologies, talking about the Monster Bass community. I think it's that, for me, it's the idea of the hunt. It's sharing. It's the community telling people or showing them specifically what's on your screen and the fish that are there has its place and its purpose. And that's great for me. I really like the education of like showing up at a lake. And like you talk about that, Jeremy, a lot is what goes on at your home lake and what you see, what you feel and really what, how you respond to it. I think is that fun story of like, I, when I walk over across the street from my house and I look at the pond and it's like, Oh, I see these bluegill. And, oh, it looks like the bluegill are up on the beds from the bass that already spawned. And now the bluegill are spawning because it's over 70 degrees. And what's feeding and what's going on? And the bass fry, are they out? There's so many pieces of information you get to put together that puzzle. That's what I like sharing with my fellow anglers. That's the information I like to ask. What's going on? Are the fish down at the bottom? Are they holding on structure? Where are they at in their journey throughout the year? Is it springtime? Is it post-spawn? Is it the middle of summer? Are the fish tired? So many things come together. And that, I think, is the beauty for me is like this whole hunt process. That doesn't really happen as much when there's forward-facing sonar and you're driving around looking for pods of fish or schools of fish and you physically just see them and then you fish to those fish. So I th I'm right with you. I like the idea of both because I think both have their space in this world. But, um, you know, for me, I, I'm really invested. I'm excited. I know Carl Jacobson is one of the favorites. Ben Milliken, I mentioned. Um, Brandon Polonick. I don't know. I would like to see you know, like any of those three guys. For me, I just have a connection through the social media side of what they do and what they represent. Um, I don't have a pick yet, but maybe we'll get some more insight. Yeah. Uh, how much long? How much longer are you able to yeah, do we'll with look, us, Jim? We'll oh, yeah. I've got probably maybe uh, five or ten more minutes. Yeah, I would love to see a guy like Brandon Polonick. You know, pull out a win. Just, just someone that, that creates some amazing content. Really good dude. Yeah. Like that, that, that'd be fun to, to see too. No, he's a solid dude. I, I mean, that's the thing. Is like he likes to hunt. He likes. He talks. He breaks down different swim baits that he uses. Different presentation. Uh, we, I know both of us have a connection with X Zone and the stuff that he uses, and he explains why he uses different baits. Uh, an amazing angler, and and it seems like just a stand up dude. And I, I love that with the personality. And what a cool story to be at the peak and at the Super Bowl of bass fishing, and then to have a relatability with humans with this whole idea with social media. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, have you have you ever fished at yeah, Grand true, true Lake? Story. The... True story. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I have not fished Grand Lake before. Okay. Uh, it's been a little bit too far of a haul to take my boat up there, uh, but I've wanted to. But I was going to say for Brandon Paul, like, like real quick, like I am there. Uh, you know, this, this is actually a 100% true story, but I mean, he was kind of the brainchild behind the hotshot minnow uh, that, that everyone is receiving in this month's box. So just kind of thought of that as we were talking about Egg Zone and Brandon Polnick. Like, uh, that, that, that is a bait that was specifically designed by him for the drop shot that is in this month's box. So quick, quick little plug, but a uh, really cool story there, too, behind that bait. Yeah, no, that, those baits produce. And I know I actually talking to the owner of Egg Zone at one point, and he was talking about Brandon and his influence of, all the baits need to be in white. All the baits need to be in black. I'm a big believer in the green pumpkin, white and black profiles, and the different colorways of the baits and just producing fish. I mean, the, the things work. So I, I love that connection. Uh, as far as. Hey, Chris, real quick, dude, I, I can't make this up. I got to share this real quick. This is totally bizarre. I'm driving right now. A car passes me on the left. Like this is bizarre. A car just passed me on the left side, right? On my left side. Driving with a steering wheel on the right side of the car, like 
Like, so my mind's kind of blown as I'm processing, like, that this guy is sitting on the wrong side driving his car. I swear to you, Chris, I look to the right shoulder, and there's a peacock on the side of the road. Like, I don't understand what's happening right now. Sorry, that was really random, totally off topic. I know I'm throwing you off right now. But Dude, you're in outer space. You're, you're, I can't you're make this up. This is wild. <laughs> Right. See, this is a, this is my right, favorite ahead. part about being on the road. No, you got this all this weird stuff, and Rick and Rob, you popped in. I don't even know if they're actually at the classic. We have no proof. We'll see if they actually get the booth set up. They could be on a road trip somewhere else. Let me ask you: How many bass uh, fishing tournaments have you participated in yourself? Is that something you've you've done? Oh, good question. Okay, so I have. Uh, I think I have fished four, three or four. Okay. All right. Now it's not very many. Every one of them, though, so far, and I say so far, has been a charity tournament for veterans. Um, and a couple reasons for that. One is I, I, I personally didn't serve. I have family members that have. Uh, my father-in-law, my grandfather. I, yeah, I've got a lot of family that has served. Uh, I never have. I have the utmost respect for anyone who has ever dedicated their time, their life, et cetera to serving our country for the freedoms that we have. So any chance that I have to go give my time for a charity tournament um, to raise money or awareness that that may, you know, whatever that may be for veterans, I, I say yes almost every time as long as it fits my schedule. Uh, one of the coolest ones is uh, in, in the middle of kind of uh, mid, uh, around the, the uh, Austin area. But basically – you get to, to take a veteran with you as your co-angler. So, so cool. I bring the boat, they match you, you with a veteran, and the two of you then compete as a team. That was a really cool tournament. I think we finished 35th, if I'm not mistaken, in that one. Uh, that was my very first tournament ever. That was a really cool experience. Um, that being said, I do have my first, I would call it like real tournament. It's a Bass Champ Eater yeah. Owners Tournament coming up in June that I just registered for this week. It's on the super pumped uh, about just that environment. I'm highly competitive. Um, but, you know, that, that being said, if I'm honest, like I personally haven't felt like I have been, I guess, good enough in my own ability and understanding of a lake and patterning, et cetera, to just show up on a, you know, Saturday, Sunday at some lake and compete without my money. So uh, I've kept my money in my pocket. I haven't uh, lost any, but I haven't won any either. So there you go. We're sitting, we're sitting even right no, now. It's, it's, <laughs> no, it's awesome. I, I mean, that's the thing. It's, I, it's crazy the stories that have come out recently about Major League Fishing, different tours, the entry fees. You're spending forty five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year to compete, let yeah. alone all the electronics, the boats, all these the travel costs. I love tournament fishing and that's the one thing is i'm competitive as well i was a competitive person whether a sponsored snowboarder or a golf professional all these different things kayak fishing was my introduction to competitive bass fishing and i fell in love with it that time stamp of you have x amount of hours lines in lines out prove it show me that you can catch the fish and so it's really cool the whole catch and release catch photo release cpr this idea of trying to figure out the responsibility of taking care of the fishery. I think that's an important piece of like fix did a great job of breaking some of that, that whole video we showed from the first event. They used to catch, I think it was 20 fish. Then went down to 14 fish. Then it was 10 fish and those fish weren't swimming away. And now even with us and stressing out fish in a live well, you go catch a fish at seven o'clock in the morning, throw it in a live well and it's floating around in a couple gallons of water with four of its best friends that stress that happens to that fish, that delayed mortality that can happen later, we're definitely affecting the fisheries, especially when we're holding the biggest fish all day long. But doing the best we can, there's there's all these negatives and things that can happen. But at the same time, I love it. I live for the adrenaline. I love learning that when you catch a fish, and it's so fun to watch your partner for the first time when they're in a the tournament, they'll catch a fish. Instead of just using a the spinnerbait, their adrenaline, they're so excited. You put that fish in the live well, the next time they cast, they're burning that spinnerbait in. It's like, take a deep breath, center <laughs> yourself. Get, it's like, no, your your retrieve was so different pre-fish, post-fish. And learning those things about yourself as an angler and how you cope with the stress. I love seeing when people quit. And when I say quit is lines out or at 3 o'clock, they don't have a good stringer. 
at two o'clock and they're like, my day's done. It's like, you know how many, how many days you've gone out and you find a feeding frenzy and you find a school of fish and whether it's with a spoon or some kind of bait and you catch one and immediately catch four, five, six fish, you can win a tournament in less than an hour. You can win a, you can win a tournament in 20 yeah. minutes. And so that's the fun part of me is like, yeah. I, I say I like to see him quit. I, I hate it. It's sad. And it's, it's this understanding. The reason I say I like it, I will fish until the last second. I've won tournaments at my local club when I had five minutes and I needed a fish. I knew exactly what I went out to my favorite rock pile and I caught a five pounder and I called the tournament director and I was in my kayak. I'm like, got him. And they all looked out and I'm like, got him. I was holding him up. And, and that was the winning fish at the buzzer. And so I, I love that stress, the competition, those things that you learn about yourself in the tournament setting. And then the chance to fish with a buddy and, and a friend or a, a life partner and doing something together. I think that's a really unique thing as well is it can be a team sport. You don't have to catch all five when you're sharing the live well. It's the best five out of the group. And so you can fish different baits. You can see and, and form the pattern working together. And I really love that aspect as well. So when it, when is your next tournament? Because I want to real, real quick though, Chris. Yeah. Be, be, before we uh, hop into that, Jeremy. So J- Josh really wants to get some steaks on the grill at some point. So uh, I, I think <laughs> is he, uh, he, he is he is queued up, um, okay. and sure. uh, I would love to bring him in before we get going on that, just because like. Oh. I'm really curious what he has to say on these topics too. Um, I love yeah, so hey, I'm, I'm, I'm about to hit. I'm about to hit a dead zone, anyways, with my soul service. So okay. I'll hop off. Let Josh join, but also let okay. him know when he joins that I, I'm the group master, not him. Oh, right. uh-oh. Just let him okay, know so, that. so <laughs> I'll explain that fix in a minute of how this comes around. But let's let's bring in Josh because we need to see what Josh has got cooking tonight. I can't wait to have this this discussion. All right, I'm going to hop off. You guys have a great evening. Thanks, oh, we get the you. background noise and everything. We got, we got, I'm so excited for tonight. So, Fix, the backstory behind is Josh is like world-class chef level. I think he's got a commercial deep fryer in his garage. I have a smoker. We, we like to cook and, and poke fun of each other on the internet through social media. And fishing the Lone Star pulls out his George Foreman grill from time to time and tries to ante up his uh, fried burgers and things on the Foreman grill. So there's a little backstory inside joke when he was mentioning that. So, Josh, welcome to the show. I, I've said it many times. We're brothers from different mothers. And, dude, I'm excited to chat about, you know, a little bit about fishing, get to know more about you. And uh, welcome. Tell, tell us this, the setting. Where are you at, my friend? Hey, man. How you doing? Can y'all hear me? I got you. I, right. I got you a little, um, a little bit light, but I, I mean, just talk up and, and we're ready. Let's go. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sitting in the uh, in the driveway in a chair out here at the house. Um, my service probably is not as good as it could be if I rode into town, but you know that's that's country life. It's just what yeah. we do. That's right. We got we had Rick and Rafi in here for a second at the hotel. They got to go set up the booth. We got you out in the country. I'm in a parking lot in the family car. So this is what it's all about on the road. We were jumping into the Bassmaster Classic. And before we get into any tournament fishing, tell people a little bit about yourself. Like, where is hometown for you? Where do you normally go fishing? I know you've got your business. You're always taking care of people's yards and stuff. What is fishing? What does it look like for a week for you? Do you get up in the mornings before work? Do you fish in the weekends? Give us some insight of fishing in the life of Josh Moody. So I am from Macon, Georgia. I currently live about 20 minutes north of Macon and Juliet. And uh, I fish a couple lakes around here, some ponds, the rivers. Um, I'm, I'm real keyed in on, on about a 200 acre lake right now, just during pre-spawn, the spawn and the post-spawn. Um, you know, I, I fish whenever I can, if it was up to me, it would be seven days a week, all day, every day. But, um, I'm a little too old to wake up and go fishing before work now, just cause of my back. So it's evenings during the week and it's, you know, both days on the weekend, if I could manage it. So, you know, so, just, tell me how, how did, how did that happen? Like what in your life turns you into fishing? I'm always curious of when that started. So my dad, um, he, you know, he fished all his life and I came along and he threw me in the boat. One of my earliest memories is losing a hat on a lake that's probably 10 minutes from my house when we were going down 
the lake hauling tail and uh i was maybe four so i mean i've been on the boat i've been i've been around fish it's been second nature as long as i can remember you had no choices in your blood that's awesome so tell me bass fishing tournament because we'll get to that do you ever fish in tournaments i do not i fished awesome. one tournament maybe two and a half three years ago and i won second biggest fish in the tournament and you know that was enough for me. I, I really like, I'm, I'm a, I'm a monster bass hunter. You know what I mean? I'm, I don't care about <laughs> trying to compete with a bunch of people and people being in my way. I'm like, who's that on the water? You know, like that's... <laughs> who's in my honey hole, man. Get out of here. This is my spot. It's my day. Right. Right. So, so nice, yeah, nice I just, part. I like, I, I... go ahead. I was going to say, I like to go out and try and catch the biggest fish I possibly can. And you know, that's, that's why I'm on the water. And that's why I wanted you on the show today. We're talking about bass fishing. Is we have like the Super Bowl of bass fishing. We got, I mean, the Bassmaster Classic arguably is the most important term of the year. And you are the backbone of bass fishing. You're the person that doesn't fish in tournaments. You don't look to achieve to go do that. You don't need that. You're out fishing with your own story and your own hunt and your own reasons. And I think having those things talked about openly, do you have... Do you have a connection to tournaments? Do you watch favorite anglers? Do you do you follow that world at all? No, I mean you know on my Instagram feed I follow Bass Nation. I follow a couple professional anglers. Um, Gerald Swindle, he's one of my favorites. But you know what I, what I see through that is about as much as I keep up with it. I have a couple buddies that are like, did you see such and such do this on there? I'm like, no man, I was fishing. So I mean like I, you know. <laughs> That's, I, I tell you, I have the same thing. A lot of friends will ask, like, oh, do you see the sports game? Do you see this? you know who's the new quarterback? And I'm like, I'm, I'm so invested in the things with my limited time to do outside of family stuff. I'm like, I want right. to go and do stuff. I want to, instead of being a spectator of it, and no disrespect to anybody that finds value in that, because I think that's important and that's fun. But at the same time, I'm maybe I'm more selfish. I haven't figured this out yet, but maybe I'm more selfish in my time because I want to do and I want to go and I want to experience those things myself. Uh, Gerald Swindle, I mean, hats off to that guy. He's 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 one of my favorites for sure. Just his connection to the outdoors, connection to family. He's a comedian, but he's just a good dude as well. And to see that he's still competing at that high level, what an absolute stud. So tell me. Do you ever get influenced by what pros are doing or how they fish? Or how do you find your influence of like the best techniques and the best way to catch fish? For me personally, it's about the areas that I fish, you know, you've got to, you got to become familiar with your own waters. I mean, you know, things translate across the country from body of water to body of water, but a lot of bodies are, a lot of bodies of water are unique in the sense that you got to learn it and they prefer different things over say the lake next door. So, you know, I just, I fish off of past experiences, you know, year to year, you know, yeah. Instagram has helped me a lot because it has really become my fishing diary. It gives me archives to tell me what I did on days. I can remember seven years ago by looking at a picture, what I did on that day and maybe where I need to go. So it's, it's history based more than anything. That's awesome. And you actually, you make me really mad because I saw you already caught a frog fish. And this is the fun that I get with with Instagram, social media, that instant gratification to see my friends across the nation, you're already catching frog fish. And it's like, my fish are still, Northern California, they're they're still cold. They're still off the bank. They're still, you know, 12, 14, 16 feet deep. And you're over there in Georgia just catching frog fish, making fun of all it's over here. So I love that personally. I love to see what you do in comparison, like you're saying, across the country to how I'm catching fish. And then I'm, ex I'm inspired. I'm excited. I can't wait to catch my frog fish this year. Once the water warms up, we start talking about top water. Tell me with your boat, because you've had some an evolution of bass fishing with boats. And recently you got a new boat. How do you, did you ever have a kayak? Tell, tell the followers and the listeners, like, what was your evolution of from bank fishing? Because I still see you catching hogs off the bank. But what was your evolution of getting into the boat you're in now? So I've always been, uh, you know, on foot patrol wherever I could cast, a, you know, a pole at if it was a pond or a creek or whatever. But uh, growing up, I was always in the back of my dad's boat, you know, pretty much every weekend and during the weekdays that we could go. Um, I, I, you know, maybe along the age of 18, 20, I think I got a kayak and 
I, I fished out of it a little bit, but you know, I just always figured I'd tip over, you know, setting the hook. So it, you know, um, it, you know, he let me take the boat out when I, when I could drive and, uh, he passed in 2017. And when he did the bass tracker that, you know, y'all have seen me in a lot, that was his and turned into oh, mine. Cool. And, That's you know, awesome. I just, I started putting my camera on, on one of the, the seats in the back and started filming. And that's how that, you know, happened. And, uh, you know, I, I started fishing out of kayaks, you know, mid twenties, maybe it, it was intermingled with that. And, um, it, it's, it's been more, more boats than anything, I guess. And if it wasn't a boat, it was, you know, on foot, but, um, I had the tracker for, you know, as long as I've had the tracker, I still have the tracker because I'm never getting rid of the tracker. But uh, yeah, that's cool. my wife, <laughs> my, my wife, want, my wife wanted a new boat for the family that we could all take out because it wasn't the safest family-friendly boat with hooks everywhere and whatnot. So uh, we we found a good deal on the Ranger that we got now, and uh, I'm I'm in love with that boat. And that's it's awesome. you know I hadn't I hadn't fished in the tracker since, and I feel bad yeah. every time I see it. And I'm like, man, I'm <laughs> yeah, sorry. sorry. You Sorry, know. Dad. It's just sitting over there. Dad, just wait for you to take it back out and go fish again. So maybe I, I keep but, but, teasing you. When, when I come out and visit, we're going to take out Dad's boat. We're going to go fishing that someday. That'd be, that'd be for cool. sure. And the, and, the, and the reason it sits right now is because the uh, the motor the motor's having some issues, and I was trolling, trolling motor only for about a year and a half, and that's when we got this boat. And I just I have not taken it to the right person yet to get it fixed, but it will ride again, and it will have hogs slung in it once again. <laughs> when you come, we can fish out of both of them. I love it. I love. It. No, we had a buddy recently, and talking about these tournaments, we went down in the South Delta, and he had blown a rod in his motor, and we showed up, and there's like 30, 40 boats, and we had a small extra trolley motor, a little kicker motor, a hand twist throttle on the back, and then his trolley motor up front. And everyone's like, what's up with the extra motor? We told nobody that his motor was blown. And we went out and fished, and I think we ended up in the top 10, and we just trolley motored it right around the launch. And uh-huh. we, we, found, we found our fish. We did good. But I think it's cool. Tell me about your electronics. What do you, what do you got on the new boat? Like, well, how far advanced are you in electronics in your efforts to find fish? Because I know you're a bait slinger. You chuck it why do you do you use any technology to help you find fish no the only thing that's on that ranger is a little garmin screen that's in the console where the steering wheel is so you know i I look at water temperature i look at depth a lot of places that i fish i already know the depth because i've been fishing there so long but water temperature plays a big key and then i just i just go fishing man that's 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 just that's what i gotta do i just i swing it you know Yes, I, I, and I love it. I love your style. I love watching you. It's so fun because you do a great job with the photos and the videos of bringing the energy <clears throat> and sharing that story of what you like to do. And, and it's it's infectious and it inspires me. It was cool because Jeremy was talking about being at the Bassmaster Classic and seeing all the pros and seeing the event and it's fishing and it makes people want to fish. You do the exact same thing and has nothing to do with tournaments. And I think this is this whole story and the juxtaposition of bass fishing is such a cool sport because we get to go do that sport and it's the same thing as we see the top pros in the world are my buddy out in georgia slinging hogs i get to see what you do is that roscoe did roscoe say no, that's, on the show <laughs> uh, R- roscoe's inside that's that's the neighbor dogs over there through the woods but but when we when we see the things you do or a pro whether it's on television the showcasing of the bassmaster classic we get to go and duplicate the exact same thing and i think that's the connection i have with bass fishing is is my internal desire to go and have that fun i I can't wait to go and fish and do the same things i get to see you do what is what's your favorite way if you had one way for the rest of your life it's going to be successful and you had to catch fish with that maybe one bait or that one style what's your favorite way to catch fish hmm uh yeah, uh, I, you know, it, it, you, you want to say top water, probably. I don't know if you want to say any specific top water. You know, the frog is always, you know, when you jam up on a big fish on the frog, that's that's pretty unmatched. But, you know, a Texas rig hook set is almost the same thing, but underwater, you know. <clears throat> so I like both of those. If I had to choose one, I'd probably say catching them on the frog because it's just, you know, 
it's badass. <laughs> yeah, no, it's awesome. And I, I've seen I've seen your hook set. I've seen your hook set come unbuckled a little bit and fall in the boat a couple times. Like, and that's one thing that I love is like the pure raw emotion that you give fishing. Like to have that, you you can't duplicate that. I think it's one of those things that you're responding to nature. It's this aggressive interaction. It's like hunting, tactilely feeling the Texas rig. Like you're saying, you're fishing a jig or a Texas rig. I love that same thing, and it's it's more that you get to feel it and respond, where top water you uh-huh. see it. So it's two different pieces, and I I think there's joy in both of those things. So no, I, I'm with you. I'm always I like the spook. I love walking baits, and I love to yeah. see the fish annihilate it. And I think it's the noise and that engulfing noise. I also that slurp that's sometimes by the biggest fish top water, and they're such good predatory hunters, you almost don't hear them, and your bait just disappears right. as you're bringing it towards you. So I'm right with you. I think those it's it's hard to kind of pick your favorite. Um, do you ever see yourself participating in tournaments in the future? This is like kind of coming back to that tournament thing. It's just not your jam, huh? No. Would you? I mean, you know, would you, I, co- I, would you co-angle with me? Like, if we we're like, hey, let's go and do a tournament in your local waters. Would you ever? Would you ever hop on a boat with somebody and go fishing a little duo and just have some fun? For sure. And um, you know, speaking of that, my cousin who lives in Georgia as well, he's a, he's a really good bass fisherman. He owns a state record on one of our rivers here for the biggest largemouth. But uh, he he's been talking to me about fishing a couple tournaments on some local lakes around here and i'm I'm not against that i just you know as far as it being a desire of mine to go you know tournament fish like i just that ain't it but i'm not against having some fun and trying to win some money you know what i mean but it's <laughs> my, my pursuit my, my pursuit is the next biggest bass that i can catch yeah no it's awesome and that and that's the fun so that that leads me to this interesting topic of bass fishing tournaments and your five best fish that's kind of the standard of what bass fishing it's cool the intro video showed they had 10 fish on a stringer and then it went to five fish major league fishing kind of changed everything where they were going to measure all the fish you caught in a certain amount of time depending on the minimum weight requirements so at first some of the lakes it was a one pound requirement now they've gone into two pound requirements but they counted all the fish and all the weight of the fish so the best five is kind of the industry standard. Do you rate your day of fishing on your best five, or do you rate your day of fishing on your best one? What is what what what's the biggest accomplishment you're looking to to achieve on kind of like gauging your success for the day? Is it five good fish? Is it ten good fish? Or is it truly just looking for that one hog? Yeah, I mean, it's looking for the one big fish. You know, if I go catch seven two-pounders and I don't catch a big fish, I feel like I failed myself. So if I go catch a seven-pounder, you know, I'm happy. It's just... I love it. I'm, no, I'm, I, 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 progress. Of, I sense I, I sense that about you. Like, that was the thing is I see you and you're like, oh, you don't get excited, it seems, when you catch seven two-pounders. You're like, I caught a hog. <laughs> it's like I finally caught a good fish. Where do you right. think that? Where did that come from? Was that from your dad? Do you think that the one big fish thing mattered more? Or how did you come to that in your life of the judgment of the one big fish versus, you know, five five two pounders? You know, growing up, it was you know around here anyway. It was you know I caught a hog. Look at this great big fish. You know, so it, it's all it's always the goal to go catch a big fish. But you know, you also want to hone in on your angling skills that you know you make sure you can still go catch numbers in fish too so you can't lose sight of that as i probably do a lot of the times when i go out there and i'm on a four or five hour fishing session and i caught you know i don't you know if like i said i, I base my day off the good fish that i caught so it's uh no, i think it's smart it's fun for me is i have a lot of friends that are they just are all about driving the big bite and i have a buddy that's made this really big chatterbait <laughs> And he was on the show a while ago, and that definitely seems to be driving a bigger bite. I have a lot of friends that I fish with that just throw big glide baits and swim baits. And they don't care about catching a fish that's one pound or two pounds. And, and oftentimes, the bait they're using is as big as a one or a two pound bass. And they're specifically, mm-hmm. they're targeting a fish over five pounds, and they don't want to mess with a fish that's under five pounds. And they're willing to fish for seven or eight hours with what for me at times feels like complete failure, but they're 
totally content just trying to catch one fish. And so I think that's an interesting piece where it creates these different subcultures in bass fishing and you got the swim bait, glide bait guys, and now they're doing the crank downs. And then all of a sudden that whole society of anglers, they're now making a little bit smaller swim bait. And that's not to catch the smaller fish. When you talk to them, it's still to entice the monster fish to come up and play with the bait. So it's interesting because those guys, when you talk to them, guys or girls, there's a lot of girls that are now fishing big swim baits. They're just looking to drive a much bigger bite. And I think that's a whole different culture. I'll tell you, a tournament you'd like to play is like the power hours out here. There's some tournaments they're setting up where they don't care how many fish you catch in a day. You're not rewarded. But every hour, they'll give you $1,000 for the biggest fish caught during that hour. And those are kind of like swinging for the fence. It's super cool. And, and it's kind of, it's it's fun because having a bass fishing tournament where you just go out and you catch your, you know, your five fish that are maybe two, three, four, five pounds and knowing your lake and finding your pod and claiming your ground. In California, there's a Yakka Bass tournament that is a series they do. They're putting like a 30 day moratorium on the water. You can't even fish and pre-fish for the 30 days prior. So then you come <laughs> out and it's truly instinctual fishing and you got to react to like what's going on. What's the current temperature? What are the fish doing? I got to go find them. And then a lot of them are mixing in those power hours with rewarding big fish rather than catching a lot of fish. So I, I don't know. I think it's interesting of having the big fish when you're out fishing with the family. I think this is one thing to consider. I kind of do that sometimes where it's not so much about catching smaller fish because I can let my family members do that or whatever but I can still be hunting for the big fish. Tell me, what's that like on your boat when you bring out the family? Because I've seen some photos fishing. I know your wife, she's out fishing you from time to time. How has that been, like, what's that like with the joy of sharing your passion and then bringing the family along? It's really, really awesome. And, uh, you know, they all, they're all pretty competitive and like to catch fish. So, you know, my my main goal when they're on the boat is for them to catch more and bigger fish than me. Um, yeah. You know, whether it's we go to a pond or we're on the boat or whatever, it's fun to watch other people catch fish, you know, be happy. And, you know, being that you pass that along and it's something they took interest in because of you makes it that much cooler, you know. And, you know, I think you saw the video of me and Evelyn, who's my youngest stepdaughter, um, we we just she wanted to get on the boat before they did something i was like i'm gonna go fish this uh this dock light and she was like i want to go and i was like well come on and i hooked into like almost eight pounder and i boat flipped it and it was just this whole video and it blew up and it was it wasn't because of me it was because of her and her right. laughter and she asked me you know she's like do you need the net and i'm thinking in my head like yeah but i don't want you to get it you know so like you know i had i, I boat flipped this eight pounder and i was like i was amazed at myself like that just happened you know and, you know, then we took pictures and it was a whole thing, but it, it was real fun. So bringing the family along, it's, it's, it's unmatched, you know, it's when, when that moment happens, it's way greater than anything that happened by yourself. No, that's that magical piece of like having your dad inspire you out on dad's boat and now having this new boat and that becomes the family boat, those memories that you're passing on like that, that to me is what fishing's about tournaments aside it's that fun thing like you said right off the bat that they're competitive and they're fishing i do that with kelly a lot when we're fishing out it's like the, whoever gets the first fish gets a point who gets the most fish gets a point and whoever gets the biggest fish gets a point so there's this deciding factor of these three available points and it allows right. everyone to have their skills and have their fun and do the things that they can do and really it's it's just about being together on the water um yeah i i want to ask you to to go into the bass fishing world and you have your job so you have a day job and you're working as hard as you can to get out there and fish but i've also seen you at schools doing seminars promoting fishing and educating kids tell me a little bit about that what was your interaction with that was that was that at the your stepdaughter's schools or how did you get suckered into doing some <coughs> bass fishing clinics so, so that was uh that was when my wife was still a teacher she retired a couple of years ago and they had this little program at their elementary school where they were trying to teach the kids how to fish. And uh, we took them down to this Go Fish Center about an hour south of here where they have a couple ponds that they set them up with poles and they can fish. So I'd go and I'd you know, try to teach them how to cast without hooking each other. And it, it was real fun teaching the kids because they took a real big interest in it. The ones who were in the group, you know, elected to be there. So they were they were ready to pay attention and learn. So it made that fun for me because they were all, 
invested in my time there. Yeah. So that that was fun. It's not something that I have done since then, but that that one particular time, I I, I got a lot of joy out of that, and I think some of the kids at least learned how to throw. You know. Yeah, it's all, I mean, it's crazy to think of like your influence and maybe you plan to see that somebody goes on to fish with their family for the rest of their life. And I mean, do you you realize like, do you know if your grandfather, or grandmother, anybody were there further generations? Because already I think sometimes it's fun to sit back and like, wait a minute, am I like a multi-generational angler? Like you already have your family now fishing, you fish with your dad. Do you know of any other history like further back in your family line that people were fishing? Yeah, so my dad's dad passed when he was a little uh, kid, so I never got to meet him. But my mother's father, he he lived well into his 90s and passed a few years ago. But he was always on what was called the Ohookie River in a place called Oak Park, Georgia. And I mean, you know, when we went we went down there, we was fishing with granddaddy, you know, going up and down the river, whether we was wading or in tubes or in this little, you know, John boat. But yeah, I mean, it's it's always been fishing. So that's awesome. No, no, I think that's interesting. Like we think these things are like, oh, maybe I'm the first person in my family. But then even if you are just starting, that's people listening and part of the Monster Bass family, you start something like this. I mean, buckle up because as you're, as you're witnessing right now, listening to Josh talk, like it's been grandparents, parents, and it's something that you can pass on. I, I love the idea of passing information. I love the idea of helping the next generation. I love the idea of arming them with the necessities, the equipment, the technology, and just the knowledge that then they get to go out and do that themselves. And I think that's the neatest part of fishing is they still get to go and catch the fish themselves. It's not like you're just passing on this idea of having just this faith and understanding, but then they get to go and apply it and they get to do it. I think that's a pretty precious thing that we can pass on in fishing because they can kind of have the same experiences. They can go and they can boat flip that eight pounder at some point. They can probably break yeah. their rod like I would do if I'm boat flipping an eight pounder. But having all <laughs> these things that happen, that's that's the piece that we get to pass on. What? Let's kind of shift gears a little bit because I want to talk. Hey, about, hey, hey. Yeah. hey, by the way, the eight pounder, almost eight pounder, I boat flip with the M7 Monster Bass rod. So uh, if if nice anybody plug, out there is thinking see? about Hey, if anybody's thinking about getting a monster bass rod, the 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 M7 heavy is the way to go. Dude, monster monster bass, field approved. Josh's boat flip at almost eight pounders out there. I think it's pretty good. And I'll tell you, I've seen yep. some tests where people do that with their rods. They'll have their boat dry dock up on the trailer. They'll stand there and they'll put ten pounders, and they're snapping rod after rod. Trying to boat flip 10 <laughs> they do ten pound plate tests. I've seen some manufacturers and. And half of them are snapping off because there's no water density release of the fish coming up with the buoyancy. They're picking a 10 pound weight dead off the ground. They're snapping so many rods, but don't try that at home. Right. But no, I, I wanted right. to ask you, fishing has evolved and it's an interesting piece of that opening segment. I want to touch on this a little bit. And I know it's this controversial, weird thing. And you and I have talked about this a little bit. Fish catching to eat and i'm just going to throw this out there back in the, the original 1971 video we started the show with is they brought in 10 fish on their stringers and those fish were not going back home to make babies and, and to be in the water anymore and and you live in an area specifically with shoal bass which they're like this protective native species but then there's spotted bass that come in there are bass fishing tournaments or even just club get togethers where you go out and you target and harvest all the spots you can catch and you fry them up do you have any connection to that? You got, do you go out and try to help get rid of an invasive species? Are you into the fish fry world? Is that still something that you're involved in? Tell me a little bit about that. <clears throat> yeah, man. So, I mean, like, say I go fish the river and I catch a spotted bass. That spotted bass is not going back into the river because it is an invasive species where we live and they eat shoal bass eggs, which, you know, the shoal bass is a re revered fish around here because you can't find it anywhere else in the world. Um, but we've, you know, another thing about, at least where I'm from and the people I know, like we've always eaten bass and we've always eaten fish, you know, so coming up is, you know, I never heard it was weird to eat a bass till I got on social media. Matter of fact, one of my <laughs> earlier posts, when I first got on there, I posted like a tailgate full of like two pounders because this gentleman wanted me to take him out of his pond, you know, because it was getting overpopulated and he wanted them yep. out. But I didn't, I didn't provide context in this post and you would not believe 
the people that wanted to kill me for eating these fish. <laughs> I was like, y'all need to chill out. For one, it you know, I, I explained the situation. And two, like, it's, you know, I, I can do what I want to do. I'm going to do right. it in conservation. I'm going to throw the seven pounders back. But if it's going to help my seven pounders become 10 pounders, I'm going to take a couple three pounders out and take them home and eat them. I don't, you know, well, that's, that's just the way it is around here. And that's the way it's always been. And it was never, I never even knew people had an issue with that until I got on social media. And this boy, t- let me tell you, they do. Well, well, yeah, welcome to my friends from California and, and preservation right into disaster to not understand it is important. And this is this whole thing that I think it's important to have on a show like this is there is only a certain amount of carrying capacity in a body of water. And oftentimes those two pounders are the reason that your five pounders are not going to ever be six or seven pounders. And there is a heritage of lakes where you're from that have grown historically amazing fish. It is, it's kind of this whole thing of not understanding each fishery. And I wouldn't even say go on a road trip and wherever you catch fish, just start harvesting whatever you want and think you're helping because that's not the message here. But there is something to understand like you're specifically targeting invasive species. Like what a cool thing to try to help the fish that should be there and help that population. But the other thing to always remember when people are judging folks, there is a set catch rate and there's normally a department of fisheries, whatever state it is, the state angling department, that they are scientists that are saying, these are how many fish you can legally harvest and eat. And so I think that's one understanding just at a minimum is if somebody's harvesting the minimum or the maximum requirement, say if your state says you can keep five bass, if somebody's keeping five bass, that's on them. If they're keeping five 10 pound bass, well, maybe share your discomfort with seeing that because I'm not a big fan of that because we need these heritage fish to be in there with the genes. But having somebody eat a couple fish at, at some point in some bodies of water, it's actually a huge benefit. So it, 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 mm-hmm. I tell you, the fish handling and the, the, the freedom toss and all that, I think we could go hours and hours of people to get concerned about fish preservation. Can I ask you, personally, sure. do you feel like you do a good job of catching and releasing fish that you're, you're helping your fisheries? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you know, the, 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 the fish that I freedom toss are more times than not smaller fish. You know, I, I try to be as respectful as I can to big fish, but I also know that, I mean, you know, say I'm fishing a pond and I got to toss a little two pound bass over a grass line, three or four foot. Okay. Yeah. They may go a foot over my shoulder and maybe a foot <laughs> in the air. And they, 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 they're, they're released at a lower point than if I was standing up on the bow of my boat, standing up, I took the hood out and threw them back in the water. That'd be about three or four foot. So, you know, it's, it's not malicious. Yeah, it's, if if, no, I, no, if I, I felt not, like, the, if you. I felt like the, if I felt like the fish were going to suffer because of it, I wouldn't do it. But it's it's very, I mean, I've I've had people come and feel me for different stuff. And they're like, man, I thought that was like way more. And I was like, they're like, it wasn't nothing. I'm like, yeah, it's not. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think it's an interesting piece of like people getting offended, people not understanding. That's the beauty of social media is everyone's entitled to their opinion. And we're, we're fine with that. And I know you're thick skinned enough to figure it all out. But it is this opportunity for us to educate people that catching and releasing fish is not always the best if you're catching and releasing a bunch of tiny fish and your fish are overpopulated so i think that's some fun that we we had shannon gorman on here and he can break it down scientifically i'm not a fishery special like that's not my job and that's not i I think it's important understanding there is a chance there's there's an opportunity at some point to get really involved with your fishery and find out what's going on and actually make your fishery like you're doing. You're teaching kids how to fish. There's a, a responsibility for all of us to make sure that the fisheries have a future and there may be a better place to fish for those kids. So I think that's an important piece from all of it. Right. And I think it's also important to be aware of the bodies of water you're fishing in terms of conservation, throwing fish back, keeping fish. Know the scenarios of where you fish and if like harvest is going to help the body of water, harvest. If harvest is going to hurt the body of water, don't harvest. And know the regulations. I mean, our Georgia DNR, you know, they, they say keep 10 pounds of fish per acre per year in your body of water to regulate the population. So, I mean, that's 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 per, you know, the man. So, right. you know, it's, and it's I, just... And a, I, I want to echo that because that, that's something that... I can tell you openly, and this is this weird vulnerability part of being on a long form podcast and talking. I don't do my part to keep fish that are bass. I keep fish in the ocean. I go 
reel to table, whatever you're going to rod to table, I target fish to try to eat that are in salt water. I never keep freshwater fish. And I know right. in some bodies of water, that's a detriment. And I'm not doing my part to help angling and to help fisheries and to help create those big fish that I'd rather be catching anyway. And I, I don't, it's kind of an interesting piece. I don't know how to break out of that mold of catch and release only because I think that was marketed. I, Texas does a great job on their fish and wildlife manager. Like you go on their website and it says, has catch and release gone too far? And that's just that yeah, scary thing is like, the, the let them grow it. so they can grow thing is not applicable, you know, maybe in some scenarios, but if, if you go fish a two acre pond for five years and you've thrown everything you've ever caught back, then you're just hurting the body of water and you're hurting your chances of ever catching a fish bigger than two pounds because you didn't know you weren't educated. That's a, that's a big part of angling is being educated, you know, whether you're, it's, I mean, whatever, whatever it is, it's a big, it's a big umbrella of education, but I mean, you know, not, know about what you're doing. Right. No, I love it. I, Bass angler, you know, BASS and looking at major league fishing even, they go around and they're actually studying now a lot of these bodies of water and it's habitat degradation. And all of a sudden you have all these reservoirs that are filling up with silt and all of the cover for the fish is decomposing. If it's if it's a lay down or whatever it is, a lot of the, the, the timber and the wood is rotting and it's going away. So what are we doing as anglers, not just on the tournament level of like, oh, we want to catch the best fish, but what are we doing? It's just everyday people of making sure the fisheries are actually getting better, at least sustaining what we've got. So I think that's that's a whole other podcast to go from the tournaments to how we catch the fish the best versus what are we doing to make sure fishing tomorrow is at least as good as it is, if not improving. So I think that's that's a cool thing. What, as far as you and your goals of fishing, I think that's one thing before you go, I wanted to touch on that because a lot of people, it's like, oh, I want to become the best angler in the world. And that's the Bassmaster Classic right now. Do you have personal goals in fishing just for you out fishing with the family or you fishing in the future? Do you, first off, tell us what your PB is and then maybe go into what your goals are with fishing. So um, the biggest bass I ever caught was a 10 ounce, I mean, a 10 pound, 10 ounce large mouth. And that's been a decade. That's been a decade ago, and uh, I have not eclipsed that mark yet. So, like when I go fishing, I'm trying to catch that that 11 pounder. You know, it's uh, yeah. that's the forever end goal is trying to catch the biggest bass that I can find. And I mean, I feel like the bodies of water that I fish, I provide myself with those opportunities. And I I know I've missed a, a handful that were probably bigger than that biggest one that I caught. You know, over the past decade, I just it was on me that I didn't seal the deal but uh yeah man i mean just you know the goals are to i'm i'm i compete against myself i'm my biggest competitor i'm my own worst enemy you know so that's when i go out i'm trying to beat what i did the last time you know every time no i, I i'm tell you i think what you just said is it's kind of interesting where people are like oh i'm not competitive i don't do tournaments but you just framed it a complete different way you're super competitive against yourself and you beat yourself up and that's that drive to get up and to go fish. And if it's not fishing before work now, cause you said your back hurts, you're going to go fish after work and you're focused on improvement. You're focused on understanding. You want to have this knowledge. You're doing your best, whether it's a fish fry, cause you know, you need to harvest your fish and you're making sure you have the best gear. You are competitive, but you're trying to out compete yourself. So I think that's a unique view that's maybe different, but I think that's a pretty noble quest of, of, uh, what, what do you do when you sell what, what like if you catch that 11 pounder what are you going to do are you going to frame you're going to frame a picture of that fish are you going to have a fish mount made what do you do when you catch that 11 pounder i don't even know man i mean that scenario has definitely <laughs> gone through my mind you know like uh, i'm going to be there it, 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 you know it, yeah it, that'd be awesome if you were you know i don't know i've, I've fought with the feeling that i you know because you know it's I know people are against skin mounts these days, but like that's a verification of a fish that you caught. I mean, like I can go tell a taxidermist right now, any kind of dimension, I can take a picture, yeah. whatever, but it, it, it's different. So like, I've thought about that, but like, honestly, I would probably take a picture and let the fish go. And I may or may not get a replica made, but I mean, like the fact that I did it and I took a picture would probably suffice me at this day and age and to turn that sure. fish back loose would do me way greater inside than keeping that fish and like killing her because it's just yeah. that fish right there is put in the time and being that I've gotten older myself, I respect wildlife in that regard too. So, I mean, you know, 
I wouldn't harvest a fish that big, but I, you know, I'd, I'd be very happy if, if, and when I catch her, I hope to say when it's going to be a hell of a day. Yeah. I'll tell you, I mean, that's the thing is when you start researching bass fishing and you're like, Oh, the world record, you know, these fish that were 23, 24, 25 pounds, they ended up on the dinner plate. And that's it's like, yeah. oh my goodness. But then you talk to scientists, they're like, the ability for that fish to even live six more months or a year probably isn't going to exist. The reality of like a five pound bass is five to 10 years old. I'm like you, I, I couldn't catch my biggest fish. And then I, I would just, you have, I have to let it go. And I would admonish anybody like you catch yeah. a fish over five pounds put them back we'll deal with figuring out the food source for them with the smaller fish but that's the reality of having that opportunity to catch something that's that big and that cherished like what a cool thing to think that it's i'll tell you what happened in our way is a guy caught his first double digit and it was cool because it had a certain marking on it and another guy that i know had previously caught that same fish and they were able to verify it through photos and the fish had lost a little weight recently and so we're like, oh, and it's kind of an interesting gauge of like maybe the fishery is suffering for a little bit of its food. But how cool that these two guys both have the experience of catching a fish that's over 10 pounds. What a, what a unique that's amazing. thing. It's, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Tell me before you go, because I know we're getting close uh, to wrapping things up. You are yeah, I think... often seen. Yeah, go, you had something else to say? I was going to say, yeah, I, I got three hungry women inside. So. <laughs> So that's that's what I wanted to segue. So you're on social media all the time cooking food, and you've got I, I don't know what kind of grill you have. Do you do you actually have a commercial deep fryer at your house still? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so jealous. So we went to a commercial kitchen supply place. I told my wife like, I don't want a little small tabletop deep fryer. Like Josh, I think has like the real deal in the garage. Like there's nothing better than the deep fryer, and you pull that basket and you tap it to the side and the grease drains and. Whether you're making your own deep fried fish for me for fish tacos or French fries or whatever, like that, I know you love fishing, but is that the secondary thing in your life that brings you the most joy is cooking your own food? Because it seems like you love that. Yeah, it is. It's pretty nice. I mean, to know that you went out and harvested something and you didn't have to go rely on another man to go do it, you know, it's, you know, farm to table, so to speak. It's, you know, it's a good feeling. It's pretty special. I, you shared that whole thing of like taking and teaching somebody how to fish. There's also something about when you cook that food and you share that same experience of passing it on and having people eat the food that you prepared. Do you do you find as much joy in that as you do teaching somebody fish, or do you are you like what's that feeling like for you when you're cooking food and you're watching other people eat your food? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my my stepdaughters they they like all the food I cook, and it's funny because you know before the. They met me, they never eaten deer, and now it's something they request, and I mean, they love fish, so I mean, it's, it's great watching them eat it, because they enjoy it, and they compliment me on it, so it makes me feel good. That's, that's awesome. I mean, what, what a cool thing. So, I'll tell you what, man, having you on the show, starting things off, talking about the Bassmaster Classic, seeing Rick and Rafi get off the plane and get in their hotel room, talking to Jeremy, and then just talking to you to wrap things up, like a full wrapped up present, how cool it is to chat with you, to get to know you more, but really, like, you're... I don't know if you've ever considered yourself. You're a multi-generation angler. You're out teaching the next generation of kids how to fish. You're passing on your love of the outdoors. You're, you're sharing your love of food and the culinary delights that you make up for the family. You're, you're a stud. I appreciate your time. What? Tell me, what is for dinner tonight? What are you going to go whip up tonight? My wife bought steaks earlier, so I, I'm about to go whip up some steaks. Have you just laid it? Are you... Are you grilling them are you flat searing them because you have some of the most beautiful food do you know how you're making them yet yeah i'm on they're gonna be on the cast iron (laughs) post them later i can be jealous and as i'm driving home eating truck stop food i want to be living through you and this is kind of what the the joy of my life is and the people i know through social media enjoy your dinner with the family how do people find out about you and how do they follow your journey on social media I mean, Alt Mulgee Green on Instagram. I have a TikTok. It's Alt Mulgee Green 53. And that's uh, that's about where I'm at, honestly. That's it. <laughs> and then a shameless plug I want to hear. I know we've got a real estate agent in the family now. Like, where can we find out about some real estate needs if we're in your neck of the woods? Give a, give a shameless plug out there for your wife and what she's doing. 
So my wife is a real estate agent, and if you ever need a real estate agent in the greater Georgia area, it doesn't matter. She can sell anything anywhere within the boundaries of this state. Um, you you DM me or hit me up. I'll hook you up with her, and we'll we'll get you a house. Dude, that's awesome. No, I ever appreciate your time. I mean, it's so fun to chat with you. My dream, I tell you, my dreams in life, are, there's not that many left. I want to come fish with you. Whether you're out here with the family, whatever, if, if Kelly and I and the kids or somebody, we can make a trip. You and I at some point need to be on a boat. And I want it to be dad's boat. But if we can go flip some hogs together, that would that would be one of the boxes I need to check before I'm out of this place. So I appreciate you being on the show. Me too, bro. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to the day. Awesome, man. All right. Thank you so get much, Josh. Yeah. Hey, thank y'all, man. Appreciate y'all. All right, man. We'll talk to you. have a good night. Yeah. Bye. I'll tell you, Fix, what a what a crazy show starting off yeah. with that edit of the original 1971 Bassmaster Classic. We had Rick and Rafi pop in from the hotel room. We had, I mean, it, how crazy. Jeremy's driving back from his accidental connection of being at the Classic already. Yeah. We have bass fishing Super Bowl going on this weekend. Monster Bass, literally, they have a booth there for the first time. Booth, I'll remind people, 2123 if you're at the Classic. Go by and see Rick and Rafi. I was teasing Rafi. Maybe he can do a vintage kissing booth or something. I don't know what the secrets <laughs> they got. Oh, Rafi they got will going do it. On, but Rafi will do it. I know they have the Craw Claw. They're giving away prizes. What a what a cool deal. I don't know if the chat was even going on tonight. I know the thing I was logged in, I couldn't see a chat. But hopefully the people were on the chat having some fun. Yeah, we had a I'll great time you, on the chat. I was kind of holding down the fort a little bit. <laughs> no, we appreciate you trying to do that. And, and man, what a, yeah. for me, just what a cool thing to sit on here and talk about fishing. To connect with some of my friends through social media, like what a what a crazy platform. Talk about the technology and fishing of what's changed in the bass tournament world. Beyond that, like the technology to be talking to Josh face to face across the world. Fishing brought us together. Social media united us. And I feel like I have friends and family from around. I had a personal mm. thing and I don't want to go too far into it, but I had a nephew that passed and to close the yes. show. Um, he was a police officer. He was driving home and his life was taken. And I don't want to get too emotional, but his life was taken by a drunk driver. And I shared it on social media with a little hesitation of like what to share and how to reach mm -hmm. out or whatever. The people in the fishing community, incredible what's been done. I've had people message me even today. They're like, hey, I just reached out to your brother. I wanted to say hi, let him know he's, he's cared for. We love him. My nephew he left a wife and a little child and it, it's just such a tragedy there's no understanding there's no explanation it's not fair everyone's going to grieve differently but to know the monster bass community the fishing community the outreach of good human beings that have all come together through this weird social media experiment but the fishing community has has been amazing my friends and family thank you so much for your support through this. Uh, there's, there's no way, like I said, to make sense of it other than what an amazing outpouring of love and support from a fishing social media connection. That's been phenomenal to have that experience. So heartwarming. I know you fix you and I were talking before the show and it, it's, it's, you could spend a couple podcasts talking about that and, and life yeah. and life's experience and it, and it's heavy and it's, we actually had three deaths in our, our family and friends, we had an uncle that had passed. We had his funeral the day of that I found out about my nephew. And then mm -hmm. two days prior, I had another friend that was basically an uncle in the family. So it's been a heavy emotional week to understand it, but what a crazy time to come together on a show, the Monster Bass Live with fishing and friends and family. And I, I literally feel like I have a family member in Josh and I've never met him, mm. but I can sit and chat with him and I get to see what he cooks his family for dinner because of social media like what a, what a crazy world what a fun time to be alive and and i think it's as long as we look for the good we can find some good and, and thank you monster bass family for you know just letting me hop on here and rant and, and talk about fishing and the things we love and uh you know let's let's do it again Th hey, fix thanks for being here um Absolutely. helping out hold down the fort it's been fun and uh monster bass family you guys are awesome we'll check back in i know next week uh, I, I think we're going to have a show all about what happened at the Classic. We're going to have a new champion of bass fishing going to be crowned. Rick and Rafi, I know they're going to have some crazy stories and experiences. Again, stop by their booth. I cannot wait to hear what happened at the Classic. I am going to be watching the Classic. I love to watch tournament fishing. I know we're going to learn some stuff, forward-facing sonar or not. 
like I said, I'm a fan of all of it. I'm just a fan of this experience of life and let's get out, get after it, get out on the water. If you're bank fishing, if you're boat fishing, whatever's going on, go fish, connect with humans, have some fun. We'll see you guys next week. All right. Thank you. All right. Cheers.